So I'm so excited to introduce our guest today, um, Chris Browning. This is such a fun treat for me. So I met you, Chris, on the set with my daughter. I was actually doing the stage mom thing. Doing the stage mom thing. Yeah. <laughs> I was. And you, Chris doesn't need a whole lot of introduction, but I'm going to do it anyways. Yeah, he does. Um, you've, <laughs> no, you've, you've seen Chris. You're probably sitting there, if you're watching this, thinking, I know that guy. Where do I know this guy from? He was yeah. an angel has fallen. And then you recently did Outlaw Johnny Black. That's not yeah. out yet, right? Yeah. Green Light, Healer, Book of Eli. That was a great movie. Bright with Will Smith. Uh-huh. The 100, Sons of Anarchy, Westworld, Bosch. And I can't even like, the list is way too long. But those are just some of the more recent, larger things you've done, correct? Yeah, yeah. So well, you've done a lot. Yeah, I've done a lot. I've been lucky. You've had a very big career in Hollywood. And well, yeah. Yeah. So the thing that I noticed when I met you is that you were so humble and so nice. And then you start telling me your story and I was floored. <laughs> <laughs> so you're very open about your story, which is, I'm so grateful that you wanted to come here and share it. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I, I tell my story to anybody that listen, you know, I, so let's uh, start from the beginning. Okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> what I heard was, I heard, I mean, this is the only thing I heard was I went from being pretty successful living in Malibu in a beach house to living under the 405 freeway. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's my opener. Yeah. Yeah. And I always, I always, my, my old joke is then I try it cause I tried heroin once for six years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so our listeners know my story. I um, have a lot of childhood trauma from heroin, not me, but my family mm. and uncle who was murdered in a drug deal and just a lot of stuff, a lot of baggage with it. So, um, your story was so interesting to me, sort of the other side of it, and just interesting how you came back. I love the comeback. So talk yeah, to me, me about too. it. Yeah, me too. Yeah, tell our listeners. Well, I, uh, yeah, I said I, I had been working. You know, I was always I was always a drunk, though. I was a oh, interesting. highly functioning alcoholic. I was that guy that you had to tell me what I did last night. Oh. You know? but when did that start? When I was 15. Okay. Yeah, and... I was the guy. That was the guy that got drunker than anybody else and stuff. But I, I still, you know, I did well in school. I, I played in sports and played college football. And, and um, but yeah, in college, I guess the wheels kind of started to come off there, you know. But I, I ended up going to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts after college because I, I decided I wanted to write write screenplays. So. I was working in a warehouse with this guy who who uh, said I had a friend. We were up in up in Reno, just bumming around, partying and working, having a working in a warehouse. And I told him, and he said, "Yeah, I had a buddy that got in that business, and he went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts." So I said, "Cool, I'm doing that." And and uh, so I got into the American Academy, quit my job, moved down to to L.A. and uh, and I remember talking to the director of the school and saying, well, I want to focus primarily on screenwriting. And, and she's like, what the hell are you talking about? You know, this is a, it's a theater school. Here's your schedule. Focus on this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I thought I'd major and minor right. and thing. No, everybody has the same schedule. This is it. Welcome aboard. And it was all actor stuff. And I was terrified, you know, to, to, I didn't know. Really? Any, yeah, I was very, very shy. Because I was always the new guy. I, I went to like 12 schools when I was growing oh, up. Oh, interesting. So you moved a lot. Mm -hmm. You yeah. also mentioned that you're, you have a history of substance abuse in your family. Yeah, my mom. My mom's an alcoholic. She died with 40 years sober. She, she went to her first meeting in whatever, 1974 or something, and, and just put 40 years together. Just got it That's on the awesome. First try. It but took, genetically, you already had that. You were sort of predisposed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and come, you also had some marks growing up, from what I understand, just from the, the environment. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think, um, you know, divorce, um, you know, and, and I, I remember my, you know, kind of, kind of raising my little sister, you know, when I was, you know, five years old, I can remember, you know, making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches mm -hmm. for my for my kid sister because mom was always in bed, you know, mm. she was just, she was a stay in bed mom, mm. you know? And, and, um, I mean, it wasn't like she was abusive or anything. She just was checked out, checked out, you know? And, um, 
Yeah. So I kind of remember taking care of my little sister from a pretty young age. And, uh, but she got sober when I was nine, I think. But by then, you know, I was already right. screwed up. <laughs> but I don't know. I, I think, you know, I, 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 uh, I was always that I, I could schedule my alcoholism. You know, I could get, I, I was functioning. So that's fun- what you meant by functional. Yeah. Is that you could decide not to drink when you needed to not drink. Yeah. And then just party hard when you did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, it just worked. I mean, I didn't, you know, I didn't have hangovers in those days. I'd go out and drink and party all night long and then have a football game the next day and I'd be, you know, fine. Wow. Um, yeah. Um, but then, you know, and so I, and I went to the academy. I was terrified the whole first year because I was there with all these, these kids who were actors. You know, they've been, they'd been doing it since they were little. Mm-hmm. So they had this whole actor persona thing that I didn't know what that was. I'd never seen these people before. Mm-hmm. I was, I, I was a jock. Mm-hmm. You know, I came from football and, and these people were all like wearing black and, and smoking and wow. talking about John Malkovich and stuff. And I, I didn't even know who that <laughs> so they're was. They're very artsy. Yeah. I don't know who John <laughs> Malkovich was. And, and they'd say, we're, well, tomorrow we're, we're, uh, we're going to want everybody off book. We're, we're going to start blocking. And I'm like, what's off book? What's blocking? I don't have any idea. So they had been doing this a long time. Yeah, yeah. They all knew it. They knew the lingo. They'd been doing theater, you know. I didn't know anything. So the first year, I just made sure I knew my lines. I, right. I was really good at memorization, and that was about it. And and uh, But something, they saw something because, uh, well, they have these exam plays at the end of the first year to decide who they're going to take back because they only invite a quarter of the students back for, for second year. And, and I played John Proctor in the crucible and. Oh, interesting. And that was like the first time that I ever got that, that feedback, Mm -hmm. that that, uh, the audience. And I, I had, I had people I didn't know, you know, in the theater coming up and hugging me with tears in their eyes and things like that. And I was like, okay, I, I want this. You liked it. Yeah. That's and it was like the only time, it was the first time I was ever comfortable in my own skin. Oh, interesting. Like I was, my my scariest moment of the day in high school was taking my tray up, you know, at the end of lunch. You have to take up your tray and put this thing in the dish, dirty dish thing and the silverware in that thing and put the tray in, you know, because it was at the cross, across the cafeteria. We were in, always at this one corner table and and just kind of zigzagging through all those tables I just felt eyes on me, you know, I just was like, oh, don't fall down. Don't, you know, I was just so So self-absorbed and self, you know, self-conscious that it was, I couldn't stand, like I really, which, you know, that kind of insecurity is is really just ego, you know, that I, that I thought people were so concerned and obsessed with watching me do anything, you know, Mm -hmm. nobody cares, but I didn't know that. I thought, oh, it's going to. Yeah, we have a we have something called the eighteen forty sixty rule. It's like when you're eighteen, you think everyone is watching you and thinking about you, and you're so concerned about it. When you are forty, you don't give a damn what people think about you. Right. When you're sixty, you realize no one's been thinking about Nobody, you. They've all been yeah. thinking about themselves. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. But do you think that that was part of what drew you to drinking, or maybe later substance abuse? Yeah. Was that discomfort with yourself? Yeah, yeah. That's that's how I got comfortable. You know that. But yeah, when I said like on on the stage, that was the first time that I was ever comfortable in my own skin, not drunk. Yeah, you know, I I, I marveled at people who could who could go to a bar and go, let's see, what should I have? You know what? I think what do you have that on tap? I'll have that. You know, and they order their first drink of the day in a bar, a crowded bar. <clears throat> no way, no way could I do. I I had to have. A twelve pack in me just to go in there. Oh, you're kidding! Uh, I could all those people and, and oh, uh, yeah, no way. I could not go into a crowd. So a little bit of like social that. anxiety is what I'm hearing. Yeah, yeah, a little <laughs> okay. bit, a little bit, and and uh, but in that so that time on on stage was the first time that I was like, wow, I was totally comfortable in my own skin, and I don't have any any booze in me. 
And, and that's why I want that. And I kept that. I respected that, too. It was one of those things that I was like, never, I'm never going to do this loaded. I'm not ever going to. Just because that's a sacred thing for me, and I'm, I'm just not going to ever work wasted. And that was my rule. So you, and so you became pretty successful after school. I did, but you know, I mean, I broke my rule quickly uh-huh. because I got a lead in a mini series um, in Russia. Oh, and I spent 13 months in Russia being. They the, like the, vodka. Oh my God! But it was, <laughs> it was, it was. I couldn't even stand out as an alcoholic there. Right. Because everybody was drunk. It was like you could, it wasn't even a hidden thing. It was mm. the, the camera truck was like a rolling bar. Wow. And if you couldn't find Chris On Brown. Set? Yeah. That's crazy. You could drink. You could drink. As long as you could do your job, nobody cared. So sometimes guys would get so sloppy they couldn't do their job and they'd get fired. But Wow. But uh, yeah, it was, if you couldn't find me, go look in the camera truck. That's where you'd find me in there. Oh, wow. So that was drinking. when you broke that rule. That's when I broke that rule, but then it was it was you know that had just my sister had died, mm. and uh, from this disease and 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 I just had some survivor guilt and I just I took it into a to a whole another gear at that point where people would say, "Man, you keep going like that, you're going to die," and I'd say, "When? Oh, bring it, you know, because I've been trying to do it like every day and I can't seem to make it work." So, um. Yeah. Ouch. So I, yeah. And I, plus it was, it was action stuff. You know, it wasn't like we're sitting there having a deep conversation across a table like this. It wasn't a pinter play. You right. know, it was, it was action. It was underwater <laughs> stuff and <laughs> alcohol you know. and water. No. <laughs> well, no. I mean, you're, you're swimming in the Black Sea in February. Oh my God. And there's snow on, the, sn- on the bank and I'm swimming around fighting a fake shark or something, <laughs> you know, and, and they would give me, you know, get out of the water, and they they put they put vodka on you. They pour vodka and rub it on your skin, and I'm like, that's cold. Oh wait, no, it's not. It's warming me up. Interesting Some kind of physics thing. Yeah, that's so crazy. Yeah, because you know when alcohol evaporates, when it's evaporating, on you, it, feels it brings cool, right? And it brings right? but it brings your blood to the surface too. Yeah, is that yeah. what it's doing? Yeah. yeah, it worked. And so they're pouring it in me and on me, and 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 it was, you know. Nobody was going to go, that guy seems like he's had a couple. No, he's fallen off a horse. He's, you know, fighting with flaming torches. You know, <laughs> nobody's going to, nobody could tell I had a, had a little booze in me. And so. So yeah. you tried drugs for the first time. Did it start with drugs or did it start with painkillers? Um, I guess it started with painkillers. Yeah. Because. What happened, I came back, and that's that's really where I got, you know, before I went to Russia, I finished at the academy, and then I was waiting tables and thrilled to get, like, two words on Saved by the Bell or right. something, you know, and, and or, or five lines on Matlock. And right. I was like, oh, my, I've made it, you know. And, and so I was a waiter. That's basically what I was. And I got the Russia thing. That was a 12-hour miniseries. That was like starring in eight movies Mm -hmm. because I was the lead. And, you know, but then that left me with a bunch of money and a bunch of free time. And because you only work six months a year, you know. And I was just, um, I had a a back issue that put me on, um, you know, Norco or one of of the hydrocodones. Right. Lorset, Lortab. And... And that was my routine. I could, I had, I got six a day of those. So I would drink, I would drink like a 12 pack of beer every night. So I was kind of a, kind of a chunky monkey. I was, and I exercised a lot. Like I, I knew so little about nutrition. I'm like, God, someone that runs and, and does elliptical in the gym as much as me, why am I so fat? And it's like, because you drink a 12-pack of beer <laughs> every day, you dumbass. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I'm like, well, I really sweat when I run. Yeah, that's the alcohol pouring right. out of your pores. Right. So I didn't know much. And and uh, so I had um, – I had a schedule. I would just, I, I could drink all night because I have rehearsal the next day. I could just pop six of those lores at. At once? Yeah. Oh. That's what I did. I just took, instead of taking 10 milligrams, I took 60 milligrams 
And that took any hangover oh, away that I had. Lord, have. yeah. And then I'd go to work. And and then by the end of the day, I'm ready to start drinking again. And it's so a, this is a vicious, like a vicious cycle. You were trying to recover from drinking by taking. Yeah, I, oh. I would I would endure the back pain later on that day. So you're taking opiates to deal with the for alcohol hangover. and. Oh wow! <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, I'd rather I'd rather be in pain all afternoon than have a hangover in the morning. Oh wow! So, okay. so, that, so that was the start of a really bad cycle. Yeah, yeah, and then and then on on the weekends I would I would smoke cocaine. You know, I would go oh, I would okay. go buy an eight ball and and uh, and. So this started pretty soon after you got out of school. Yeah. So you're having some success. You're making some money, and but that money is starting to go to. Not so good things. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just like any free time I had, I, 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 I just pissed it away being loaded. You yeah. Know? We always, in Russia, we had a, we had a, uh, a volleyball game for the cast and crew and stuff every, every Saturday. And, and I, I went to like three of them because well, I was two a mess in. from the night before. Yeah. I'm in bed. I mean, if I'm up, I'm certainly not playing volleyball. Right. Because I got to where I would drink. The bottles there are half liter, half liter vodka. And they have like this, this uh, foil thing that you kind of pull and it just kind of rips it apart and comes, you know, there's no way to reseal them. Mm-hmm. It's disposable. Right. You know, it's a half a liter is not to be saved. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, I would. I got to where that's what I was doing. I'd, I'd wake up with one of those. Oh I'd wow! Take a big drink of juice, then chug the whole half liter, oh. and then throw the rest of that juice on top of it, all in one breath. And then I just sit there and wait for that burn, and be like, "Okay, I'm ready." Let's oh, go. you're killing me right Let's now. Let's go to work. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, when we come back, I want to like. I want to get into. The part where you end up under the 405 freeway when we in our next episode. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. We'll be back with Chris Browning. Welcome back. So I'm still here with Chris Browning. I am just, I'm really enjoying this. I've had such a good time having you here today, Chris. We actually got to see your brain. I forgot to say that in the oh, first yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. So it's good. I mean, you've actually been clean now for 15 years and we, we got to see your brain. Yeah. Well, you, and you're really honest about injuries you've had and, and those moments where you've done painkillers a couple of times, but, but for the most part, you've been pretty good to your brain for the 15 years. Yeah. And, yeah. um, it's certainly, could have been much worse. If you had been in 15 years ago, it would have been much worse. Yeah. So we, what was exciting is we can show you the improvements you can make, which I'm looking really forward to like taking you on that journey. Um, but I just, I'm actually pretty amazed you were able to get as clean as you did and do as well as you have through these last 15 years. So how did it happen? How did you, like, I want to know, like you're in Malibu, you're living in this house, you make that first purchase of heroin like what was on your mind this is a good idea or maybe i shouldn't do this no it was you know i uh what got me in trouble when i lived in malibu was cocaine because i was going and i was going downtown i had this bright red 66 impala convertible that i would take from malibu all the way downtown to alvarado to buy cocaine i didn't even have a dealer i'm such an idiot so i'm going down there in this (laughs) in this red flag of a car white guy going right in the hood to buy buy drugs every day getting an eight ball and then i would i would cook it because i was a purist i wasn't going to just buy crack i was going to get powder and cook it and make my own free base and like like a like a purist (laughs) who knows what they put in that crack you know i like to know what i'm smoking (laughs) So I'm like driving down the down the ten, you know, with a test tube and baking soda and water and cooking this no. stuff up and I'm dying right now. And, and smoking it while I'm driving a car. Yeah. And so it got that's what got me in trouble. That's cause because uh the sitcom, the last sitcom I was on, that ended and I knew I wasn't coming back to the next season. And and uh 
that I hated that job anyway, but that's a different story. But, um, so I knew I wasn't coming back and I had, I was making money, you know, the last couple of years I was making money like I'd never had in my life. And I would get a gold card in the mail, like every two days, you mm-hmm. know? So I took them. I was like, yeah, I'll take those. And, and then it just got to the point where I wasn't, I, I, I didn't have to be ready for work. So I was running the wheels off of it, you know, and, and I was, I was just smoking Coke and drinking, you know, for days at a time and praying an audition wouldn't come in because I don't want to go to it. I'm a mess and I know it. And, and ran out of money and just started getting cash advances on those credit Mm, cards. And I maxed out like 10 gold cards and, uh, and that's that's what it was. And then when I I I don't when I step when I kind of stumbled into heroin one time, um, but you know what? That wasn't even what it. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was it was heroin because <laughs> I told you I had a I had a period. I have been the the meth the tweaker guy. I've been the crackhead. I've been the straight alcoholic. And and heroin was where I I found my calling. <laughs> I, I so I, so you experimented with all of them, and you, you found the one. That well, you- more than experimented. I mean, it's a whole different lifestyle. Crackheads are a crackhead. They don't they hang out with other crackheads, and 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 tweakers, the meth people. That is definitely their own little world. Uh-huh. You know, they don't even hang out with heroin addicts. They think that heroin addicts are the worst. You know, we were talking about that before where yeah. I said the tweakers will say, oh, watch out for this guy. He's a heroin addict. He'll steal your wallet and help you look for it. And I'm like, talk, talk about the pot calling the kettle black right. because the tweakers are the shadiest. I mean, because I've been one. And when I was a tweaker, my soul left my body and hid somewhere because I was I was full of demons and it's just evil. And the and the example I would give when I'm in jail arguing with tweakers about who's the shadiest. <laughs> you, you realize how crazy this sounds to yeah, someone sitting here. It's a conversation here, right? happening in jail. There's a warning sign. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I'm going to convince this tweaker that he's worse than me. <laughs> right, right. But he is. I'm sorry. Those tweakers, because I was. When I was, a week, when I was a tweaker, it's the difference is as a heroin act, I'm going to go steal. I, I, I lived in the bushes next to the 405, and 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 uh, my everybody's got a little hustle, right? They've got to come up somehow. And my thing was I was a thief, and I would steal. I would shoplift vodka and and, and sell it to the Russian mafia guys. Uh, okay, I just can't. with my Russia <laughs> with my Russia speaking skills. Oh my god! From going hilarious. to Russia, so that, it's funny now. It would not be funny if it was still happening. Yeah. But the funny thing was, you know, these guys are, they're, they're, they're playing cards in the park, looking like retired, you know, guys and, 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 uh, but they're, they're bosses and they all own bars and restaurants and they would take as much as I could bring them. And the other guys, you know, I learned about that little hustle from another guy and, and that's how I found it. So a lots of junkies were coming through the park and going up and, and, you know, saying, Hey, I've got, you know, 15 bottles in the car. And, and they just would say, yeah, here, they pretend they don't speak English and they just give him like some, you know, take it. Cause they know they're going to take it, whatever it is. Yeah. Just, and, and, uh, then I would go in and I would haggle with them. And these are Russian Jew mobsters who love the whole game. They right. love the, they love haggling. And, they don't care about the money, right. but we can do a little back and forth and I can get, I'm getting $25 and the, and the other guys are getting $15 for a bottle. And they're like, well, what are you doing? And, but the, the Russians are like, ah, oh, yeah, it's hard to show. Those after, how to show. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And they just like, they're saying, you're a good kid. Come here, come see me tomorrow. You know? It's so funny. So the other junkies are going, well, hey, what, what's going on? And that turned into, can you do mine? And so then some days I wouldn't even steal. I would just meet, you take theirs. meet all the job broker, like a couple <laughs> oh, hundred God. bottles. I'd meet, meet me at the park. I'll be there at noon and they'd show up and I'd take my piece of that, but I wouldn't even have to steal anything. And I could still make four or $500. And so, so I thought I had a crazy story growing up. This story is, <laughs> <laughs> this story is pretty crazy. Yeah. But see, that was the difference is, is a heroin addict would, 
I'm going to go and do whatever illegal thing I got to do to get my, my, my money. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to get the, get the, uh, the dealer on the phone and, and, and get a page him and get the, and get my drugs and go back to whatever little camp I'm, you know, wherever my mattress is laying and, and spend the rest of the day being high. Tweakers will get high and then go out and do shady shit for three days. Like that's, that's the, the high is just a given. Right. The activity of doing scandalous, shady, stealing identities and, and ripping <laughs> off cars and stealing, you know, being a burglar. That's what they like. That's the fun thing to do while you're high. So I just have to say, you're, you're sitting here describing like classifying different addicts, but as someone who grew up with addicts, to, to someone on the other end of it, you're all scary. Oh, <laughs> like you're yeah, just sure, all scary. Sure. Like I'm sitting here thinking, it just all sounds horrifying and terrifying to me. Yeah, because I'm is. a little kid. If you're a little, if you're if you're another person on the other end of it, it's just like, you know, it's just it's just scary. Yeah, to us. It is. It but is. and all of them hurt your brain. So yeah. you've done them all, and they all hurt your brain. Well, you know that was the other other point that you know people used to tell me. They're like, you were, you know, you look so young. I mean, I, when I was forty, I looked like I was twenty five. Mm-hmm. You know, and and when I tell people I'm fifty five, they're like, wow, that you look, you know. And that's because my, I always say that I think I was like, it's like being cryogenically frozen for all those years because, um, my heart rate was about 40. You know, I was on, I was, I was slowed down a lot Mm. and I didn't even sweat. I was homeless and I had no BO. That's so funny. I wouldn't bathe for two weeks. I'm like, no, I'm still good. And, and the tweakers were coming through and it was like watching time-lapse photography. And these guys would come in, especially women. It was tough on women. They'd just come in and there's this 30-year-old girl who just ran away from home and she's a tweaker. Next year, she looks like she's 50. Oh, yeah. No, it's bad. Yeah. And that's – and that, I mean – I mean, their teeth, everything just starts yeah. to – yeah. And that's really- the thing. I, I would have been in a lot worse shape if I would have stayed in that world. Right. Because that's just like pouring corrosive – I mean, on your nerves and everything. Well, and so, and when you look at someone who's been doing drugs like that and you see their skin and you see their teeth, what people don't realize, it's hurting your brain before it's hurting the rest of you. Right. That's the outside of the the plant. Your skin is a reflection of what's going on in your brain. Right. Yeah. And so that's, you know, that's one of the things that we try to explain to people is like, as it's aging your skin, it's, it's just destroying your brain. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah. Cause that's the last indicator. Is the exactly. outside Skin. of the plant. Exactly. You know, you're dying from the inside out. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So no one really gets out of it free, like with that, with the get out of jail free card. At some point, it catches up to you. And it, it caught up to you. Obviously, you're living under the freeway. Sure. So, you know, you, yeah. you, it's like you said, you even said it sort of steals your soul when you're doing, you know, the tweaker thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, at, at some point, you obviously decided that it was time you were done with that. So in our next episode, I want to, I mean, not a lot of people can do that. So kudos to you. Um, not a lot of people are going to go from this extreme of being successful to living under the 405 freeway to then having the will and the, just the heart and whatever it takes to be able to come back from that. So Mm. in our next episode, let's talk about what you did. How did you come back from that? Okay. And go on to, you know, to have the successful career you have now. Cause I mean, I read the list earlier and you've got a very successful career. Um, you've, you've been in some great, some, some great shows. You've got, you know, purpose in your life. And so we'll talk about all that. Okay. All right. We are going to start your new year, your new decade off with a bang. Tana and I are going to do a six week live class. So starting January 21st, Every Tuesday, we're going to be with you for an hour. And at the end, we're going to give away over $20,000 in prizes. We look forward to helping you kick off this new year by becoming Brain Health Revolutionaries. Welcome back. I'm still here with Chris Browning this week. We are talking about not only addiction, but coming back from addiction. But in case you missed... Um, in the first episode, some of the things that you might have seen Chris on, um, Angel Has Fallen, your new movie, Outlaw Johnny Black, mm. right? So yeah. we're looking forward to seeing that. Green Light Healer, um, the Book the of unhealer. Eli. Oh, Un- the Unhealer. Yeah. Unhealer. Book of yeah. Eli, that's coming out soon also, right? Book of Eli? No. No. The Unhealer. 
The unhealer should be out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, that was a thing with uh, Natasha Hensbridge and and Adam Beach. Okay. Fun. Um, it's kind of a supernatural. I'm thing. gonna look for it. Yeah. Fun. Um, but I remember you from the 100 and Sons of Anarchy and Bosch. Those are three that I watch. So, um, yeah. So pay attention. Look for Chris, and you're just a great actor. Thank you. It was really fun seeing you on set. And we've been. I was just so. Yeah, we did a thing. We just did it. Yeah. Uh, I was doing the stage, stage mom thing, so it was yeah. fun. Um, so my daughter actually got to work with you, and that was really fun for me to see. In Escape from Area 51. Yeah. You should see it. Yeah, I can't wait to see it. Yeah, actually. it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. So we've been talking about, you know, as I was sitting on set with you and you were talking about, I heard you say I did heroin once for six years and I ended <laughs> up living under the 405 freeway. And I'm, I'm like sitting here watching you and I'm, you know, you've got this incredible career that you have now. You've been clean for 15 years. So you're living Mostly. under the 405. And at what point do you decide you need to get clean? And how did you just make that decision and make it happen? That's a hard thing to do. Well, I, I, knew, I knew the answer was there. I knew, you know, my mom was sober for 40 years. So I was raised by sober people and, and uh you know, I knew that's where the answer was. It just, it, it just wasn't, I didn't seem to be on the list. You know, I've seen it working for other people, but it was like, I don't know the secret handshake or something because I was, I was going, I was in and out and in and out of recovery for 12 years. It took me 12 years to get a 90 day, mm. you know, I couldn't be, I couldn't stay sober for 90 days. And did your mom know where you were? Um, well, the way that they kept track of me was checking with the L.A. County jail system. Mm. That had to be heartbreaking. Oh, my God. I, once, once I did get sober, I talked to my mom and dad every day for, for till they died after that. Oh. You know, for, um, I can't imagine because now I have kids. And right. I can't imagine not knowing where my no, kids are. No, the pain are. would just be terrible. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, no, I track my daughter everywhere she goes. So yeah. I can't imagine. That's smart. Yeah. Um, so, but but you got the ninety days, and then I mean, at what point? Like, what made you finally? What made it stick? Um, I was just thinking about that the other day, because that's a that's a common thing that comes up when you when you're uh, you know sometimes you, you you tell your story and stuff, and 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 people or even in interviews, they, they say, what what was the thing that what what made it. What made it different? What made you stop? I never stopped trying, but I just, it was the first time that I actually applied what was being, you know, suggested. All those years, those other 12 years, we were, talk, we were talking about uh, being an egomaniac mm -hmm. with an inferiority complex. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what it was. Because I could be right off the streets, 60 pounds lighter than I am now, and and asking someone you know, to help me get sober. And they're suggesting, well, you do this and you do this and you do this. And, and I would say, yeah, I don't need to do all that. I mean, he does because he looks like he's like a landscaper or some, some manual labor guy. He's not as smart as I am. Mm -hmm. I'm much more involved than he is as, you know, and this is a scrawny sucked up heroin <laughs> addict off the streets covered in abscess sores. Right. Uh, sores. And I know better than that guy. That's how. Do you think that's common with with a lot of the addicts? Sure, I mean it's not. You know, it's just only it's the only disease out there that tells you you don't have it. You know. Yeah. And and but I, actually, I was always pretty forthcoming with with admitting that I was. You know, I, I, so you can't live in the bushes and tell and try to convince yourself or anybody else that you don't have a problem. Yeah. You know. Um, I was. I was like, yeah, I, I'll, I'll give you that. I'm definitely an addict. And an alcoholic, I just don't think, I don't think. I have to uh, jump through. Yeah, I still, yeah, I'm going to alter whatever suggestion you come up with. I'm going to give it my special spin because I'm so, I'm so wonderful. Right. You know, and I just kept getting kicked in the ass every time I tried it. I went to 20 detoxes. I went to five rehabs. I spent three years of my life locked up and, you know, you're not, so every one of those times I'm, I was, clean, you know, kicking heroin on a, you know, concrete floor that in the LA County jail. Not fun. Yeah. Terrible. That's how my uncle had to kick it too. Ugh. Yeah. That's awful. But, yeah. um, so for whatever it was, there, I, there was this guy named Gus on the streets and, 
And I just met him. I was like, if I ever find that guy, he's probably dead. But if if I ever did come across him, I would thank him for for saving my life because he was talking about it one day. You know, you just, there's plenty of time to talk. That's what you do, you know. And he was 30 or so years old. It looked like he was 60. Skin and bones, alcoholic. He always had a pint of vodka in his pocket. Yellow skin, jaundiced eyes, and it just he was dying. And and he just said, you know, that's, that's, he was on, everybody's on parole. I wasn't on parole, but, but I was on probation, but I'd never been to prison. But he'd said, yeah, man, that's what, that's, I'm, I'm a dope fiend. I'm a drunk. That's what I do. So they're going to catch me again, and I'm going to go back upstate on a parole violation and do six months or nine months or a year. And when they let me out, I'm running. I'm not trying to pee for the man and have an address and a job and all this stuff because I'm a dope fiend. And my thing that kept me relaxed about how serious it was was telling myself that I'm just passing through. Mm. That's this is life experience. You can't. You can't. I'm going to write about this someday. You know, this is I'm sucking the marrow out of life. Mm -hmm. You know, this is real life. And but I'm just passing through. And, and it occurred to me that Gus probably talked that yeah. way at one point. Yeah. And if I wake up tomorrow talking like Gus, I'm doomed. I'm not getting out of here. If I, if yeah, I wake there's, up. There's some point where that needle shifts. And yeah. now. And you've given up. It's too far. And you're like, yeah, no, I'm, this is me. I'm a heroin addict. If they catch me, then and when I get out, I'm going to do heroin. It's, you know, how does that guy get out? Right. He doesn't. And. So the people dying around me left and right every week, someone, you know, got, got murdered or overdosed and, you know, and those are the kind of friends that you have on the streets. So my, my best friends were the ones who were willing to wait for me to overdose before they took all my shit. <laughs> <laughs> You know, those were my good ones. Those are my I'm buddies. I'm going to have nightmares tonight. I'm going to have like night terrors. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. It's like my worst nightmare. Yeah. I thought it was yeah. bad having a heroin addict live in my house when I was little. Oh. This is like terrifying. Yeah, no, it's just, it's, it's, because that's the other thing. There's always, there's always those guys on the fringe that are, that are you know, that you're watching you, you. You see them, they're, they're, they're thinking about taking it now. Right. And there's a couple and of And they're willing to do to some nasty things to take it, probably. Yeah. I mean, I, every week it was like I felt like I was in, you know, Vietnam or something. And, you know, and, and somebody died every week. Crazy. Got, got murdered. And so got, that time it stuck. You got your 90 days. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that time, you know, and like I got hospitalized three days in a row in L.A. County Jail. Three days in a row. And when I got out of there, because there were riots every day. And, um, you know, I always talk about this, like you never know what the gift is going to be, right. you know? So whenever something bad happens today, I'm like, you, you there's, this is good somehow. Yeah, somehow. Don't know. Yeah. Don't know yet. But I learned that cause I, uh, I had, you know, I, was, I got broken ribs that saved my life. Yeah. You know? you know, I have three questions. Whenever something really awful happens, I have three questions that I've learned to ask myself. What can I be thankful for? What can I be grateful for? And what can I learn right mm. now from this awful thing? There's got to be something I yeah. can be thankful for, grateful for, and I can learn. Yeah. So, and if you can do that, I think it really changes your perspective on life. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I've seen that happen. Like, you know, I get kicked out of a place that we're, and, and you're like, oh, I love this place. I can't believe we have to move. And then you end up in an awesome place that you right. never would have found if you weren't kicked out. In a healthier yeah. situation. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah. like what I'm in now. I'm living in a house with people that I care about that I, you know, and I was in a terrible situation before, but now I'm, I mean, and if that hadn't blown apart the way it did, I wouldn't be where I'm right. at. You know, I get, I said, I broke, I had broken ribs that saved my life mm -hmm. because of being in jail. I got in a riot and got a concussion, woke up in the infirmary, my head all bandaged up. Then they put me back out in general population. That time, they were, they were, in, we were in the chapel and they rocked, rocked the pews out of the floor. They bolted to the floor and they stood them up and they were tossing them, like falling them in trees. Oh my gosh. And I was like, ah, and crushed me. And I got, and I'm back in the infirmary now. My head's bandaged up and I got one of those rib protector plastic belts, you know, hard plastic yeah. things, Velcroed, and I can't breathe. Back out to the general population and, 
And this place, the third place, was in a, one of the dorms. They have about 150 people in there. And they'd been there for a while, so they'd had time to make tools, make, make, make right. weapons. Take a piece of metal and just grind right. it on the concrete for a month. So it's a point and wrap bed sheet and string, you know, what? and when that jumped off, I ended up with a guy on top of me, um, with, and a couple of, a couple other gang bang- bangers from, from the other gang were just shanking him. And like every other time they miss him and they'd hit me. And, and I got pierced in the arm right here and, and it was an artery and just blood started oh my going, God. going out. And I was like, Oh God, here we go again. Passed out. Woke up in the infirmary and and they had a stitch in this and and the doctor said you're lucky to be alive and I'm like really that he goes no look inside and inside my gown <gasps> that plastic belt was so dug up with notches from those shanks just stuck. So your broken inches. ribs really did save your saved life. Saved my life. Yeah, that's a great perspective. Yeah. So you never know what the gift is. You never know what the gift is. <laughs> yeah. So I love the story and I want to talk about, um, I want to talk about, cause when I met you, what I love was you were talking a lot about purpose and mm. we talked to our community a lot about purpose, about, you know, people who are purposeful live 11 years longer, but they're also happier. happier so yeah. they're much happier, especially people who have been through a lot. They, they, if you can find a way to turn that around and either help others, help someone less fortunate than yourself, you'll just always see the brighter side of things. And when I first met you, you were talking about, like the thing that struck me the most, I mean, of course, I, I with what we do, I hear a lot of stories about addiction, about abuse, about trauma, but I don't always hear the comeback and the story of purpose that goes along with it. And that was the thing that really caught me. And that's when I started talking to you about how you need to write a book. And like your, your story is a book. I mean, this is a crazy story. I mean, I know everybody listening right now. And if you're listening, please, you know, send us your questions, your comments, love to know what you think, but this is a book and it's, it's, you know, here you are now 15 years later and you've had your ups and your downs. You've talked about that, but you keep going and you're doing so much for other people and you're very humble, you know, in spite of your success, you're very humble and it, it was really refreshing for me to see because we see a, we see a lot of people, we see a lot of celebrities, and a lot of them are struggling. Not all of them are humble, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but it's um, it's just a really refreshing thing. And you you just talked so little about what you have and what you who you are versus what you were doing for other people, and I thought that was really cool. So let's come back and talk about that. Okay, I would love to hear that. So this is our last episode this week with Chris Browning. If you haven't heard the other three, please listen. It's just a crazy story, um, but a great story. It's a great story because it's, it's real life. It's what we see. It's hard. It's, it's hard life, but it's a story of comeback. And I just love how honest you've been willing to be. It's been so great. Your story with addiction, your recovery. um, And we got to scan your brain and show you, show you how much better it can be. And we're going to rescan you in a couple months. Yeah. Well, that was a little disconcerting when your, your husband's like, yeah, we took a picture of your brain. Oh, <laughs> oh, uh, but I know it's, it can't be the worst. No, not even it, close. And it, 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 and he even said it's, he, one thing he did say, cause people always latch onto that part. Yeah. So let me remind you. <laughs> Especially an alcoholic. Right. So let yeah. me remind you of the part where he said, you know, considering, you know, it, obviously you have been not bad your brain for 15 years. Now you've been really trying to be good to it. And so that's why it looks as good as it does. And we're not past the point of no return. Absolutely not. That's, that's what you I You have got. a lot of hope. I got so, hope. And it's not going to take that long. And there's stuff we can do. Yes. And, and that means I get to do, I get to come back. I had to do all the, by the way, this, you know, thank you. For, Absolutely. You, these people are wonderful. And I just, I don't know how I manifested you. But thank you for showing well, up. Thank you. It's, and we're grateful to you as well. This is <laughs> so, going to help a lot of people. I'm serious. This is really, I'm really grateful to you also. Well, I'm, I'm volunteering, you know, if there's ever anything more I can do in this thing, please ask. Thank you. Because it, it helps me, keeps me sober. Um, 
Well, and that's what we're talking about. We're talking about purpose. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. It's like, it, it, this, it wasn't like, I'm not just this purposeful Gandhi of a guy. I'm, I, I'm, I'm an alcoholic and a drug addict. So I'm selfish and self-centered by nature. That's my default mode. So I've been, I, I finally got willing and humble enough to take suggestions and direction from other people. And I stuck around for three months and, and started getting the rewards that, mm -hmm. you know, the, the things that I'd never felt before. I'd come in, <coughs> I'd come in or come around, try to get sober for a month or two and just be miserable called white knuckling, mm -hmm. you know? And I was like, I don't, I'm, I'm, and it's a <laughs> feeling when you know for a fact you're going to use again, mm -hmm. you're, you know, you're getting together with people in recovery and you're like, yeah, they have something. I don't have it. I'm not done. I know I'm, and it's a horrible feeling. And so when I, when I finally got three months, I, I was comfortable enough in my own skin and I was looking people in the eye, you know, and I didn't have a secret. There wasn't anything on my breath. There wasn't anything wrong with my pupils. This is me, like it or not, take it or leave. And it was something that really puts you back straight, you know, mm -hmm. and puts a bounce in your step and gives you a confidence. It gave me one that I, that I'd never had before. So, and, and that came from taking direction from these people that have been doing it a while. Right. And they, and the thing, one of the things I used to hear from people like old timers, as they say, people who've been doing it sober for a while. One of the things I would hear would be, you know what, kid, I think you might be too smart to get this thing. Mm. And I was like, well, that's oh, cool. that's a really good point. <laughs> yeah. And that was definitely the reason. Because you could rationalize why. Yeah, I would uh, I would do. I'd think my way out of it and go, yeah, I don't need to do all that. I'll do some of that and a little bit of that. But all of those, nah, I don't need that because I'm smarter than everybody, you know. And that that kept me in a lot of pain for a long, for a lot of years. But the other thing was I heard was quit whining, go help somebody. Yeah. And I don't know why it works. I don't do it because I'm Gandhi. I do it because it feels good. Because right. I'm an addict. And I'm I'm all about feeling good. And I never would have thought that it could feel so good to help people. Right. But it's awesome. It really does, doesn't it? Yeah, well, that's I mean, what we it, try and tell people. If you are trying to recover from whether it's depression, substances, I don't care what it is. If you go help someone, it takes you out of yourself. Yeah. It takes you out of yourself just for a little while. Yeah. And it can make you grateful for something. Yeah. And purposeful people live longer. Yeah. And, it's, and they're and, happier. And stuff comes to you. Yeah. For, for you know, it, it's like the universe is going, I see what you're doing and I'm going to reward that. You know, you, you're around people that are positive, positive things happen for you, yeah. you know, so that there's a lot of selfish reasons that I do it, but, uh, I opened a treatment center, um, my, uh, first wife and I, and, and a, another couple, um, we were asked to open an, open a, a, a treatment center in Taos, New Mexico. That was like the best year. I was around for a couple of years, but the, the opening of that. Yeah. Once once we got the, the patients and parents and all that involved, it stopped being fun. Right. But it's work now. But building <laughs> it. Yeah. Building it and being there and that that you know, just knowing that you're doing something to help people. I, it was one of the best years ever. Well, and even when I was trying to schedule your appointment to come down here and be on the podcast and get your scan, you um you were funny, you're like, Well, I'm feeding the homeless on that day. So, you know, we were trying to schedule <laughs> I'm like, that's cool. Like yeah. that's, you know, I mean, that's what you're that's what you're doing. Well, and so, and that just comes from, you know, there's, there's people um, that, that they're like Donna Jericho. Yeah. She's that we just did this movie with, and she's, she's the one that told me about it. And I'm like, I do that. Mm -hmm. I do, I, I do that every year. I'm doing that. I didn't know that she was going to be at it as well, but it's like, yeah, well now, now That's we're fun. definitely going to do it. Yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, it's just, and they asked me, they were, you know, there was a lot of press there and they, they asked me about it. Why, why, why here? And why are you, why are you doing this? And I said, cause I've been in this line. Mm. I've been in this line. And now I'm in a line of, 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 uh, plate runners mm -hmm. or in the back doing, you know, steamed vegetables or whatever in, in my place in line and whatever. But I've been in that line and 
you know, how, how can you not if right. you've never been in that And line? most of those people, I mean, it's funny because other people see you, they know you, and Hollywood's all about who's who. But a lot of those people, they don't care or they don't know. They're yeah. too gone. They're too hurt. They're too down. But you're still there helping them. Yeah. You know, they're not feeding your ego. They're just there. Yeah, no. In fact, a lot of them, a lot of them are really just not grateful at all. No. Some of them are just, they treat you right. awfully. Yeah. But they're just really in pain. But they're know? also, they're, like you said before, their souls have been hijacked. Their brains yeah. have been hijacked. Yeah. So see, that's something we know. Yeah. You know, those drugs hijack your brain and your oh, soul. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've been, I've been, I've been very selfish and entitled and, and, and rude, you know, and had, you know, been in that place before where you just want to, you want to bitch about something, you know, to, and I don't know, it's just something good always comes of it. And it, and it's, and it's, that's it. It's not, it's, it's, I heard a good, like humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Ah, yes. And, I love that. I love that because if I'm thinking about someone other than myself, good's going to come from it. Yes. I mean, if nothing else, because I've stopped thinking about myself. Yes. Just if that's all, yeah. it's better. You know. So. I say I totally agree with you, and it's not always easy to do. It's you know so, because we're we're all a little bit selfish. <clears throat> so, yeah. but that's why taking those steps intention to be intentional and be purposeful with other people and help other people are so important because it takes you out of yourself. Yeah. Well, I think you have to be, you know, you have to be doing that for yourself. You know, if you, if you're anything though, if it's, if it's trying to get in shape or trying to get sober or trying to, you know, whatever, if you're doing it for someone else, it, it, it better be about you before too long because it just doesn't work. That's what we often say is you've got to get your why right or you'll never do the what. (laughs) You got to get the why right. Yeah. So your yeah. why has got to be big enough to move the what. Yeah. And I've seen it, I've seen it work where people, um, they, they, they try to get sober because of a spouse or a nudge from the judge, mm-hmm. you know, that it's like, you want to go to prison, you want to do this, you're, you know, or you want to go to jail or you want to go to treatment. And so a lot of time, I don't care what gets you in the door, but it has to be you that stays there. You know, it's, it's, it's got to be for you. And, and plenty of people, myself included, have, have needed it Yeah. for 20 years. I needed it. Yeah. But until I wanted it, I had no chance. Right. You have to want it. You have I to love want that. it. And that's the thing, the gift of willingness. Yeah. You know, you hear that a lot because I did. I got to that point where I didn't care. I, I was like, you tell me to stand on my, on my head butt naked in the corner and yodel. I'll do it. Would just tell me what you the want me to do. The pain was great enough. Yeah, yeah. And as soon as I got that mindset, good things happened. Yeah. You know? And and it's it's amazing, too, that I, you know, I, I, see, I see it in my kids. I see my kids doing lovely things because- Because it's because, being modeled for because them. Because I'm so- Yes. Yeah. And because yeah. you're modeling it for them. Yeah. And just think how far ahead of the game they're going to be. So yeah. one of the things, so my book that I'm writing right now, which is really funny, we haven't talked much about, you know, some of the differences in our in our lives. Um, the book I'm writing right now is about breaking that cycle in the next generation. And so and it's based on my life story, which was, which was pretty ugly. But mm-hmm. mine starts off with, I'm just going to say it. I was a judgmental witch. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sitting in front of a bunch of drug addicts. That's when I had my epiphany. I was Mm. teaching, I was speaking at the Salvation Army to 200 addicts, and I am having the most vile thoughts. I'm angry. (laughs) I'm like, and I literally, I left and I told Daniel, I go, I can't do this anymore. I cannot do this. I cannot come back. And I started crying. And he goes, why? And I go, because I don't like these people. (laughs) And I don't have, I don't have empathy. I don't have compassion. I can't help people. And I told him, I looked at him, I said, God picked the wrong person. And if you know my husband, which most of the listeners know something about him, he's got this very sweet, empathic little smile that only psychiatrists and husbands have, I think. It's so <laughs> annoying. It's like really annoying. <laughs> Honey, he's God, right. yes, God picked the perfect person. I'm like, Ugh. Uh, and I was just fighting that because, <laughs> but then the book, that's how my book opens. And then it flashes back to my childhood where my uncle was murdered in a drug deal. And, you know, I got people breaking in my house, my mom shooting the gun in the house. And I mean, there's a reason that I felt that way. Yeah. It didn't just start out of nowhere, yeah. you know? And so, but it ends with this epiphany that I have. 
that if, like I said a prayer and somehow that prayer was answered and all of a sudden I looked out and I didn't see them or addicts. I'm like, oh my God, they're, they were scared children just like I was. Mm. It's like if I can help one of those people, that's one less scared child in the world. Mm -hmm. And it just was this massive turnaround in my own world. And from that point, it just, it completely changed my life. It changed the purpose and the direction and the tra trajectory of my life. Yeah. Um, so I'm coming from a little bit of the opposite yeah. place that you are, but yeah. it's funny how you can end up in the same place. Yeah. Pain, pain. Yeah. You know, you were in pain. And but we were all scared children at one point. Yeah. That's yeah. where we all started. And I went, what? And I sat there thinking to myself, where were these people before they started doing drugs? They were probably scared little kids like I was at some point. That's what I thought about that Gus, Gus yeah. guy. I could, I, he, he was 30 and looked 60, but you, he was one of those guys that you could still see the little boy with a skin broken. Knee. Yeah. Crying Just about broken. a boo-boo on his knee or something. And maybe know? someone wasn't there to help him. Who yeah. knows? Yeah. Yeah. I, that's, that's, and then that's we wonderful. start here, but we can, you know, meet in this place in the middle. Yeah. With healing. It's pretty cool. Oh, that is cool. And so that's why when I heard your story, I'm like, you, that's got to be a book or a movie. It just has to be. It's like the other side of the fence from mine, and it's it's just an amazing story. Well, I want to do it. I mean, you're gonna you heard it here first. I'm gonna yeah. write a book, and it's because because I pushed the, him. <laughs> and, 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 and yeah, but I just you brought it. You, you brought your you brought it to Daniel, and he's like on board, and 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 it's like you guys just decided. No, we're gonna help him make this happen. Yeah, we're, I want to hear from you guys. How many of you, if not yourselves, have someone you love that this is a story that you can relate to? Right. So either my story, which you were on the other side of it and you're judgmental and you don't want to help and you don't want to get involved because you're scared or you are the person who really has struggled and either you haven't come back from it yet or you're trying to find a way back from it or you have come back. Almost everyone's been touched by it. So would love to hear your comments, your questions. You know, we love to read your questions when we're not having a guest. We're we answer questions and talk to our people. So oh, I send come it back to and us. Read questions. Oh, I would love that. OK. Yeah. When you come back to do your scan, let's do that. Yeah. All right, so send your questions in because Chris Browning is going to help us read them. It's not going to be – my book isn't going to be some how, how to by, no. by the guy who figured it out because no, no. I am far from that guy. No, we want to hear your story. Yeah, I'll tell you my story, but I'm just – I'm one stupid mistake away from being right back on the streets. You know, that's – I can't – that's just – But knowing is. that is probably part of what keeps you – Knowing that, yeah. Rather mind. than being bulletproof like I was before, where it was like, no, I can do this. Yeah, I won't get yeah. addicted. I can, you know. There was all these lines in the sand that I was like – I was wiping them and making new lines like every week. Oh, like maybe, you know, I was doing that, but I'll never do that. Yep. And next week I'm doing, doing that, that. Yep. and going, yeah, but I, okay, I would never. But that's it, the bars here now. But yeah, then. <laughs> yeah. You know what the best, you know, you hear about reaching bottom, you know, yeah. you've reached your bottom when, you know, whatever. Best definition I've ever heard for, for the bottom is, is you've, uh, you've reached your bottom when circumstances around you are declining faster than you can lower your standards. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that great? That's pretty bad. Because <laughs> I couldn't keep up with the lines. It's like, oh, forget it. You know, I, just let it go. It's yeah. I'm I'm a piece of. So now I have no standards. <laughs> I have no standard. I have no. Wow, standard. that's I mean, pretty still, There are some I never things that I'm proud of as far as you know, because I saw a lot of people, and you know, especially in jail, I saw, I saw a side of humanity that. I don't even like knowing that those people that really right. exist, you know, there's some dark, dark people and, and just dead on the inside mm -hmm. killers. And, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that I didn't ever do. I never, I never victimized people. Just yourself. That was my, yeah. When I was on the street, people are robbing and ripping people and beating them down and taking their <laughs> and I never did that. I never, I never could, could do that. And I just, I could steal from supermarkets and yeah. like that. And, um, you know, I tried to make, I tried to make an am amends to them. Oh, interesting. And I'm like, you know, I, I can't begin to pay back the million dollars in liquor <laughs> that I stole from you over the years, but, um, I'd like to start, you know, just to be paying on it. Wow. And they didn't have a column for that. 
Oh, interesting. It was like, we, I, we can't know. They've written it off already. It's done. Yeah. No, they're like, make a donation to a, wow. to a thing or something. But they don't have, yeah, it's written off. The right. books are balanced. You'll screw it up. Yeah. <laughs> if you give us that money, we don't know what to do. It's, it'll, it'll throw off. Throw yeah, off so everything. go help someone else. And I'm like, oh, that's fine. All I need to do is make the gesture. So, right. So we're good. Right. Thanks. <laughs> is that, what is that, step four? Uh, nine. Nine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. In twelve step programs, yeah. which I'm not, you know, endorsing or denying or what is the word? I can either confirm or right. deny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't care what people do to get sober. I, I just, you know, I, I every and everybody's everybody's program is different. Some people, you know, they've got they do this kind of thing and they supplement it with this spiritual belief right. and this pursuit. And I don't care what anybody's thing is if you're if you're if you're not lying cheating and stealing and using then more power to you right you know i don't whatever it is whatever your little thing is you know that's if i can uh, if i can lay my head down and go i didn't lie cheat or steal today and if i was wrong i fixed it Mm -hmm. because that's the thing i get into a thing with somebody and then and just be like that you know I'm, i'm walking around you know, taking poison for this guy. Right. He doesn't even remember. He doesn't care. He doesn't, he doesn't care. know. Yeah. Right. And and so now I gotta go, hey, you know, that thing, I was I was out of line, man. I'm sorry. Whatever. And then it's clean and it's, and I don't have to I, I that's not on my list. When I go to go to bed, I'm not I'm not carrying that. Yeah. And that's 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 been a big thing. Cause I'm that I'm that guy that can hold on to that for a long time. Until well, we- and the thing I, that I noticed about you when I met you was just how raw and open you were. And I just, I, I appreciate that. So that was just a really nice quality to meet in people because you don't see it very often. <laughs> and um, someone who's just really like, it's funny when you talked about not being comfortable in your own skin, because I, the word I would use is comfortable in your own skin. No. That's how, yeah, that's how you seem to me. So you were just like completely wide open with who you are. And that's just not, you know, most people are trying to, really? oh cool. yeah, no, most people are wearing facades like crazy. I'm, 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 yeah. So it was really refreshing. I'm yeah. totally petrified in here right now. Yes. Yeah, so you don't seem that way. You're just so, telling us everything. See, guys, I'm an actor. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, we appreciate. You think I'm well adjusted and comfortable. In, no, I'm, I'm, I'm much so, much more so today. Well, and we just really appreciate this. You know, I was, I love the saying pain shared is pain divided. And when someone hmm. is willing to step up and share their pain, somehow someone else out there that's in pain is like, oh, okay, it's not, I'm not alone. Yeah. And there's hope for me. Yeah. So that's why I just really appreciate you being here, well, telling your you. story. And I get Looking to Looking forward back. to that book. Absolutely. Yeah. Help you get that written. And you guys write about whether or not you want to read the book. Yes, please. Let us know. Send us questions, we're, comments. We do, we're doing a whole proposal thing and we need your data. Yes. And make sure you share this with someone that you know that's suffering, um, that's either recovering or suffering or just needs some hope. And you can reach me through the show anytime you guys got a question or you want some advice or that's something. That's awesome. From someone who's just making it up a day at a time like the rest of us. But Yeah. No, we appreciate that. It's just talking with talking with another, another one, it's... That's what keeps me sober. Love it. Thanks. Thanks. If you're enjoying the Brain Warriors Way podcast, please don't forget to subscribe so you'll always know when there's a new episode. And while you're at it, feel free to give us a review or five-star rating as that helps others find the podcast. If you're considering coming to Amen Clinics or trying some of the brain healthy supplements from BrainMD, you can use the code PODCAST10 to get a 10% discount on a full evaluation at amenclinics.com or a 10% discount on all supplements at brainmdhealth.com. For more information, give us a call at 855-978-1363.